fourth intermezzo, opus 116, from 1892, by Johannes Brahms. So moving. Interrupting the silence, the short sighs of the right hand. Isn't it unnecessary to even explain? First of all, I'm unable to. It's not the point. I find that in your interpretation, the imagination connects to the emotion and the individual storytelling starts working as a sound painting that you discover as you paint and the landscapes appear, the characters appear two pieces in one, the um, perhaps two former lovers, one regretting and the other one accepting. In a dialogue that reaches at the punctuation, a moment of, let's say, collision. And Brahms uses this with an extreme subtlety of the interruptions, the contradictions, and the two against three rhythm that allows to have this um, dissonance of characters reach a certain peak and then resolve. For instance, <laughs> trying to describe the storytelling is um, unveiling something which is so personal for every person. Like in Debussy's uh, setting of Colloque Sentimental, where the two former lovers meet at the park where they used to meet when they were younger. One regretting and asking, do you remember? Do you recall? Don't you miss? And the other one who says no. No, and no. The shadows and the hopes, or the shattered hopes, and the other one who goes ahead. So you have, in a way, the right hand, and I take the risk to be cheesy, the rational. <laughs> the regretful, the irrational, the one who cannot satisfy from the fact that whatever story was started between these two in dialogue was inevitably not pursued or not blossomed. I would not go as far as to say that the opening is in C-sharp minor for the top part an E major for the bottom part and then afterwards they both find themselves in B major.
that is not true. On the surface, you could say that, but it's not true. It's more subtle than that. It's innuendos, it's unresolved resolutions. Compared to... in this first edition of uh, published in his time he has the legato for the left hand that has arpeggiato which is rhythmized harmonizations and then he has non legato for half of the arpeggios which leads to that dominant in fact B major of the E major but then you have something unbelievably intimate that is quasi-modal. And that is the subtlety of the subtleties of Johannes Brahms. He lets us drift by thirds. in E minor, no more major, in the minor third, G, but in fact it's an F double sharp. For those who see the score and those who hear, they don't know. And it goes to bring the G sharp. I find that moment of hope, or not, expectation to return in E major, or the desolation of the E minor. Could have been. But no, he returns. And again, the left hand implements the part of the involved person who has turned the page and says to the other one, stop lamenting over all that. And the other one is divided in two parts, psychologically. You have to sing, you have to play legato, you have to implement it, you have to say it on the lip. This kind of Schumannesque hypersensitivity of the character, of the, of the expression of any little detail. So of course, if you bring out the secondary voice of the opening, which was the dropping intervals of the sigh, restated at this bottom of the first page, he adds, Brahms adds, very discreetly these hugging eighth notes that are trying to convey and connect with the rising left hand on the third, the lower third. So we have these meeting points on the third beats. But if you bring out the top part, get to the opening. What can I tell you? I don't have to tell you. I'm sharing with you the emotion that rediscovering, teaching, performing, having learned, and all these pieces like this one are companions through a lifetime, path of life, a different season of life, to the matter of fact. I find that to be very touching. And then, at the same time, like in the Colloque Sentimental that Debussy said in a French art song, 
you have here um, the expression of almost spoken melodic lines. Uh, <laughs> of the tent is almost like a ripping literal in the sound painting as well as in the psychological depiction of the two characters getting getting to the point to which they break their own tension <laughs> overlap in impatience of saying oh no oh yes oh god oh no oh please how can you not how don't you dare remember or miss and he returns to the same opening emptiness how he interiorizes the chagrin between the spread and the we struck to her. This hesitance of semitones, these hemiolas, these uh, drops by um, very small steps, I think it's like really size. What else can it be? And what he does is that he returns from the dominant of G sharp minor with a leading tone in the melody on the top, but then the passing tone goes back. That, that C sharp, the third note of this bar, you don't imagine could be written, but go back. And this time the other doesn't answer or plead anymore. No more register as if there is no more to talk about this anymore. Forget about it. And that's when I think comes the moment of the most incredible tension, release and intensity and tenderness. As if from a distant past, from within, far away within, comes out the memory of these beautiful early days. in the notation he doesn't write that these are quarter notes to be sung and legato connected as the strings of an orchestra in a symphony he imp imposes the middle notes while well, seen on the piano notation he could think is melodized fa la mire fa do mi si 
Vela, sorry, but I think orchestrally, but he'll probably hate me, the Johannes, but I think is. you have to explain it to the student to justify but what can you justify the notation gives you 16 notes of an arpeggio and the third beat a chord that is half plucked in a highlighted halo and then the melodic descent chromatis is a major minor hold b sharp up c natural down half minor but really disappointment but this third beat dropping the C natural minor to B sharp to A major fourth degree are arpeggiated but he doesn't say when he says with the wiggle the, by choice he says do what you want if not he would have rhythmized it I could love it in 16th notes consecutive to the early two beats arpeggios like this perhaps even in a triplet of eighth note of course since it's unmeasured by choice from him leaving us to us or imagining we'll find the right intuition that he had perhaps not caring if we're gonna do it one or the other after all I would say, let's try the other way. There's no right or wrong, in fact, it's both ways beautiful. But the fact is that in the notation, it leaves us that little room where he says, oh, you can make a triplet, you can make it a quarter note with a lot of quick notes are projected, or then I was thinking the flow of the 16th note. It's this most infinite tenderness. It's hug, it's tenderness. And then the triplets, the rhythmic ritenuto. And then he asks for no unacorda but piano. Second ending. Earlier it was in G sharp minor when we had the return of the memories. Reminds me of the B section of <laughs> G minor printed by Rachmaninoff. <laughs> contrast of something tender dropping out of your memories can't restrict it and cannot stop it it's evident that Rachmaninoff played a lot of music as a pianist and some things somewhere are in the subconscious I like to think that but perhaps I'm wrong anyway it doesn't change anything to the incredible beauty of both pieces Rachmaninoff's and Brahms uh, and this one he was at second ending as if every time the voice of reason overrides the voice of emotional recalling um, this 
endless nostalgic desire to go back to it. But don't you remember? <laughs> emotions of unfinished sentences. Perhaps they were the overlapping kisses when they were young or hugs. And now they are almost painful in minor in me for me in the tone painting. Some kind of ripping. Opening again of the left hand while everything always in the right hand is sighing down and the left hand always tries to rise to contradict again he doesn't have upper stems I wish he had Johannes please Johannes will say, I see too much into it. He's reserved. Pudi. And finally we'll come towards the end, the soothing. The sol solace that Bach brings as well. But Brahms knows how to. To himself. To us. Here we have the semitone in major and then we have apparently the semitone rising chromatically up as an answer but if you invert the voicing you have the minor dropping so Johannes even if you don't like it sorry it's not to be smart it's to be honest and for me at least to be earnest this half minor, the minor six, major third, literally the tears in a smile, and the left hand crossing over the right hand, almost the sweet carelessness of the youth. erasing the future hopes that became later what is it else than regrets and now he gives us the coda times he ends the piece. Once in G-sharp minor, once in um, C-sharp minor, and once in E major. And in between are waves of emotional outpour from the right hand dropping down its tears and uh, of the left hand trying to hold up to a certain restraint and reserve. And this incredible duality of the two, overlapping sometimes almost hugging. They say often that writers write in any of their novels another version of an autobiography in innuendo hints and between the lines. Perhaps it's sometimes forced uh, um, and almost too much expected. But I think that um, it's not always wrong. And besides, the point is, is that this gentleman didn't write music for piano, except amazing music for chamber um, works with piano after his early sonatas. And then in the last years between 1892 and he dies in 97, he writes this series of short pieces, which he calls intermezzo, like as if it's 
between things like um, something insignificant on the title purposely to belittle the intensity of the abyssal intensity of the regrets of the pain of the nostalgia of something that will never come back the salt shaker is almost over but the memories are lively and they're youthful as if you can reach them within your dream, in your daydream. I mean, okay, perhaps for sure, and I'm aware of it, that I am a nostalgic person myself. I don't help it so easily. I don't consider it necessarily a problem or a pathology. But I must say that when I enter the musical thoughts of the composers with whom I interact intimately as a pianist teacher and all the others functions. Perhaps it's an identification with life. How can you feel what is to love to miss and when you're very young you feel it by intuition but not by experience. Now does it mean that it's more meaningful because you have experienced something in your life compared to the life of the peace through the path of life that goes with you this intermezzo that ballad this symphony this aria this concerto this opera i mean the film the story the uh, the incredible poem the statement the saying we live with our inner worlds in our inner worlds it's inhabited with ways of um, making sense of the nonsense that helps us perhaps it is helps us by pushing us deeper deeper in the abyss or perhaps we feel like it's comforting to do so to um, ma mind our wounds or perhaps all this is just as i said it so trivial so unsubtle compared to the poetic innuendo hints that are in this piece. Different cultures react differently to loss, hope, love, tenderness, missing, trying to reenact, retrieving a distant memory, and then you relieve it differently. Oh, when, 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 we look towards the future and now we look to our future from the point of view of returning in the past as if time is timeless <laughs> This was letting myself entirely float on my own emotional gondola. Now we'll try to play with all this intensity that I received from the piece that I shared with you in my gauche words. But this time I will play this opening without to succumb to over too much emotional rubato. one is more convincing when I project it rather than when I try to receive it while I project it. It's not the same. I will try to think now only of the melodic lines and I will try to play this opening perhaps still with more rubato than the second time but 
This one I would like it to be only the dialogue of the intervals, the innuendos of what the music itself says and not all the symbolisms that I want to attach to each of those gestures by my emotional storytelling sound painting. first intuitive, unrestricted, emotional let go. described in my tone painting the difference not only of moods between the two hands characters dialoguing contradicting and misunderstanding or misrecalling the abyss that is between them and at the same time their desperation at least for one of the two to reconnect okay but what i did is that i played the left hand in a tempo that was quasi andante <laughs> answer was adagio. So the inserts of the two hands not playing together allows for this dual tempo. It's not bitonal, it's bitempo. Of course it's not indicated and even if it were I don't know anybody would accept it because it's um, taken away the subtlety but why I mean who defines who is the arbiter of the good taste in sufferance in the elegance in accepting the empty nest who I don't know but not me I offer you all here to share the different intimate earnest ways I can express this music that hints more than it says and perhaps I will go back to the unified tempo. the two against three rhythmically that always had given me a lot of um, chagrin because it feels like obviously every beat the hands are together and every half beat or second eighth note you place the second of the two between the second of the three and the third of the three and it's not exactly in the middle it's too mechanical tam, pom, pa, tom, pom. and when you try to let it glide slide or grind against the second of the three then you realize that the two against three is incredibly more unstable and at the same time it allows for the melodic line of the two become one phrase instead of more interruptions with the two against three becoming an interruption because one of the two is obviously not fitting. And then you start looking at the score and you hear the thumb of the left hand And there you go, Emil again in my 
creative voicings. I think they're embedded, even if they're not notated with the stems up and down, that will give us the confirmation visually that if it's not in the text, it shouldn't, but because it's in a text, it should. And what if it could? What if it's to be guessed? What if it's not wrong to guess it? Perhaps people who play it shouldn't just play what they read, they should play what they daydream on the reading without to be betraying the score. It's not about authenticity or lack of. It's about um, implementing your own expression. You say it. I mean, come on, I'm alive now and I'm saying it now. Why should I hold back? Because a score says that it doesn't say it completely, but it might be if you manipulate it. So you could say, okay, then it's artificial. Now, of course, I purposely demonstrated too much. The point is, is that if it was indicated with the stem, we would do that. But there is none, so then I have to hint it, but more subtly. Or then just forget it and just melt the arpeggios as they are meant in the two against three. There is already so much to do with the half minor. Dilemmas, dilemmas, dilemmas. Oh, wait. Dilemmas not for everybody. Because you have those purists who will say it's all in the score, I don't have to do more. And Mademoiselle Boulanger would have told me if you read so much into it that it's not into it, but at least on the score, write your own piece and play his like he wrote it. That's what I didn't try doing, but I still Thing that part of the interpretation perhaps is the creative highlighting of voicings that while they are there without to be indicated are they are there potentially how much you bring them out how much you self-censor yourself not to bring them out that's a question of character education perhaps I lost mine I'm very responsible as a teacher because I tell them not for jury audition exams or text land or textians that has become the global political correctness of music performance competitions publishers musicologists okay fine but when you have nothing to lose like me well you know you would like to say I respectfully we create something that I read in it that is there. You don't have to be convinced by me, probably you're not. Probably you consider, oh, he's doing too much. He's taking away the simplicity. And what is that simplicity? Often I was told that in Schubert, play simple. I understand what it means, in fact, as a listener. I want to hear a line, I want to hear a phrase, I want to hear something that goes somewhere. And I have to go through this path. Winterheiser, of course. Of course, if I do, I understand it's too much. But why? Because there is a not enough? Or because Everything outside of the tempo is rubato, everything outside of the innuendo is an exaggeration. Perhaps the creativity should be limited only to full creativity and not to creativity within the piece you play, or you display rather, in terms of the layers, the innuendos. So as a teacher, I'm very cautious. I inspired by the piece, try to inspire the student to see all these potentials that the piece is hinting us. 
no more the composer, no more the interpretations, no more the combined uh, comparisons of this and that style, genre, uh, mode, uh, mod in French, um, fashion, you know, uh, fine, just the intervals, the music, the sounds. Or the quality of repeating or not or halfway in the key um, the common tones in these descending thirds the A between the F sharp and the D sharp for the F sharp which of course on perhaps uh, Brahms's piano needed to be fully replayed not to be an empty gap so if you have a very close touch inside the key subtle in depth but from close the true legato, not only overlapping but uh, over singing. Yeah. Whisper to the point of dying of its last breath and restarting. <laughs> out the top line when there wasn't second line is what intuitively you wouldn't do you do it intellectually because you analyze the score but if you follow your instinct your emotional being you want to hug you want to go to and you touch this dominant and of course then the decay happens to the long notes and you hear more the moving notes so you have to make a choice you cannot have them both I don't consider the eighth notes under the opening long values that we heard here in this second three and eight restatement to be just decorative I think they're thematic they're meaningful they're speaking they're saying something about the sorrow do you remember how wonderful it was don't ignore what it was and the left hand consistently almost as if as a character rejecting the desperation of the one of the right hand dropping recalling and here rising the point to say it's all done it's all gone enough and I find that if you're aware of this kind of duality, very Schumannesque in the sense of um, Florestan Eusebio's um, duality or schizophrenia or um, bipolarness, regardless what you call it, here you have two characters that in fact look differently at their past. Just like in the colloque sentimental, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> Such flow of tears, such flow of emotions, reaching almost every time, everywhere it wants to escape, to exalt this recalling, it leads to a different dead end. Yeah. 
he does that kind of contusion in one opus 17 number three. And here's the same kind of choral statement. And you notice it's always in a low register in the left hand territory. And every time this happens, the right hand comes up with another wave of recalling. There is no crescendo, so what do you do? Okay, I'll try without. But I don't feel it. It's terribly flat. I feel like I'm holding back something unnatural. Very natural. Yeah. So what? It's not in the score, doesn't mean it's not in his intent. Perhaps he lets us develop what we see in it. Ah, Johannes. I know he's reserved and in music he unleashes all his tenderness that perhaps he was not able to in real life. After all, we are lucky. Because if he'd been in real life, good for him. But we would have had received nothing poetically, universally, timelessly, that talks to our intimacy of our own, while it talks to the universal of all of us. And even if you don't name any of what I suggest, just listen to it, and it's all it takes. I am a convinced converted, but I don't need to be. I can be also open-minded and think, okay, whatever that means. For instance, at the entrance of this um, unbelievably tender arrival from the above of the section, he has this G minor chord and he starts with a third, but it's already the dominant of E major with the common tones. So you could have the third beat with the rest on the left hand and just suspend it in the air, this unexpected moment after the conclusion. to have the ambiguity of staying this, even if it decays, it can still, while it holds, give the illusion of G-sharp minor with the third on the top, and the fifth, and then... If you play very much at the moment of the whisper of the sound inside the key, say that he wants this and this together but I find that then you extract it and it appears you can hear it in layers you can hear it independent or you can hear it overlapping you can hear it decaying and resonating you can hear it and you have to project it with the pace and the flow with the elegance of um, the um, cultivated awareness of all of that, not about analytical on paper, just emotional um, shivering. <laughs> Typical me going overboard in the example how he could have but didn't and Thankfully, it didn't go like that, because as soon as I do extra, it's cheesy. But the point is to go back. Is the Brahmsian, if any of the Brahmsian obvious um, tools is the Kapawa del 6, like in the opening of the D minor concerto. <laughs> Six, 
six will be Brahms, but he's not. And when he does it, we think, oh, that's of course Brahms. As if he's doing what we expect him to do. It's almost reassuring, it's real solace. And let's say he didn't do it, it would have been... in harmonizations in the arpeggio in the left hand and then he hints it inside the octaves that's six or the third depending on which direction you see it is two against three and delayed chromaticisms, resolutions, tensions, and then at the end is cheesy. But at least you're happy that you know that he didn't do it. Thank you, Johannes, for your good taste. Cannot be allowed to do this innuendo of, of an imitation. Perhaps it should be so hinted that it should be unnoticeable but there. Now it's too obvious. Oh, la, la. be my own devil's advocate. <laughs> Man, no, he wants me. I know, Johannes. It's not the wrong clef. It could have been G sharp in bass clef, but... You highlight the chord from above and unless, unlike from under, it should have been. It's above. I can spin in this chromaticism, Johannes, forever. I don't want it to end. No, you wouldn't agree. I know, it's like Bach, isn't it? Delayed resolve resolutions until you get lost in them. Of course, Bach never got lost in them. Harmonic changes the mood, not what you add to it. I should have known by now. Thank you. 
I know. He's probably laughing at this. But you know what? I really mean it. Why didn't you show it? And now you're teaching. It's scary because I end up speaking to the dead composers and worse, I hear their answers. As long as I'm aware that I am crazy, it's, I'm not that crazy. Perhaps I want to be. Something irrational about connecting with some person to feel so close yet so far in time and you'll never meet. Such kinship that you develop just playing it, not even rewriting it, that less. for the soul in pain of this loss. Plagal ending. Almost pitchy ending. I know you wouldn't agree, but that's what I think you wanted to do. The thirds, the sixths, the triplets. the highlighting halo chords. I think it has to go la sol fa mi. It cannot be. Well, it could be, but uh, overall. You can make it say what you want. The text sometimes. But you chose to highlight it up. Therefore, the melody can be also splitting between its drop and the harmonies rising. When you do overlapping chord like this, I don't know where is the beat. Probably you didn't want either. It's not ritenuto. If I do it in tempo. Anyway, it's a two-beat bar because you start with the uh, beat in the first place. I almost feel like the violinist of the early 20th. Gliding to reach the notes. Like in the Mendelssohn slow movement of the concerto. And here I would have done if it is I don't have that capacity, Johannes, I don't have it to finish with a smile to conclude this it's probably better to conclude it in major, not to keep the wound open in abyssal. That solace that you give us in the hemiolas and the mistinato. It's almost the same key as the eighth cantata by 
Mai Bach. This case, yeah, probably that solo is a D major. Did you know that cantata? Probably not. So what? So many. Probably think this guy's too much. I dare express myself. At least I have for me that I'm earnest. I'm not trying to play games or an effect or. Does that justify what I do? Probably not. In my inner mirror, yeah. Out of all these, um, Options, thoughts, fine-tune, voicing, existent or imaginary. How much would I do when I have to play to play with the integrity, the cultivated knowledge, as well as with the emotional outpour of the spontaneity that is not completely and shouldn't be completely stifled by the well, yes, it should be more for me than for others by the reason. Perhaps all of this will blend and melt in something flowing and not so demonstrative for each of those details I shared with you. Perhaps they hate just to be in a smile, in a gaze, without expressing it or just in your mind. And only choose what to express out. Impress, express.